The topic of limits can sometimes be a little confusing, but let's see if we can shed some light on it. Because when it comes down to it, limits are just really, 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 really teeny tiny flashlights. Let's start with something that you're probably already familiar with, reading the value of a function from its graph. Say we have a function that looks like this, and we want to know f of 8. Remember that the x-axis represents inputs to the function, and the y-axis represents outputs. Since 8 is the input to the function, we find it on the x-axis. And then let's imagine that we have a little laser pointer, which we point towards the graph. And let's imagine that the beam from that laser then bounces off the graph at a 90 degree angle, highlighting a value on the y-axis. That highlighted value, 6, is f of 8. Using this approach, we can find the output of the function for any input, just by dragging our laser pointer along the x-axis. Great, but what about limits? Well, the main difference is that a limit is about what happens to the function around the given input, rather than directly at it. And for that, we're going to have to cast a wider beam. So let's imagine that we have a flashlight that can cast a nice, crisp, rectangular beam. What happens if we point this at our graph and let it reflect at a right angle to the y-axis? Well, let's start with just a linear function. If that line has a steep slope, the reflected beam gets wider. If the line has a shallow slope, the reflected beam gets narrower. And what about a negative slope? What does that do? Think about it for a moment. Well, it gives the beam a little twist. Do you see how this image allows us to see how multiple input values are mapped to their corresponding outputs? Now that we have a little intuition for it, let's play around with our flashlight on a few different kinds of functions. We've got curvy functions, broken discontinuous functions, functions with little holes in them, and even wildly, infinitely squiggly ones. By the way, you can play with this yourself using the Desmos graph linked in the description. So, to summarize, we've got the laser pointer and the flashlight. The laser pointer gives us the value of a function at a specific input, whereas the flashlight tells us the output, or image, for a whole interval of input values. And with these two tools in hand, I think it's time to take things to the limit. To understand the limit, we just need to take a couple more simple steps. The first is that we need to put a tiny little black dot in the center of our flashlight so that the beam it casts looks like this. And by the way, when I say that the dot is tiny, I mean it's infinitely tiny. But since I can't upload this video in infinity K resolution, we'll just make it really small. We can see the effect of this dot most clearly with point discontinuities. So say we have a function defined as x squared whenever x is not equal to two, and seven whenever x is equal to two. If we point a laser beam at the graph from x equals two, we can see that it passes right through the hole in the graph and reflects the point of discontinuity, resulting in an output of seven. Thus, f of two is seven. On the other hand, if we point a flashlight at this function around the input of two, we see that it does highlight the output of seven, but it also highlights a totally different region surrounding y equals four. This reflects the fact that, aside from an input of exactly two, the function is just y equals x squared, and so inputs around two are going to give us outputs around four. Now, by placing a dot in the center of our flashlight, we can tease apart these two aspects of the function, focusing just on what the function does around an input of two, but not exactly at an input of two. In a way, what we're doing is kind of taking the flashlight and subtracting the laser pointer, thereby cutting out the direct value of the function. Okay, so now that we have our special flashlight with a dot on it, all we have to do to take the limit is make our flashlight tinier and tinier and tinier. Again, ideally we would make it infinitely tiny, but that would make it invisible. And one thing about visualization that I've learned over the years is that it works best when it's visible. Anyway, when we zoom back out, we can see that our infinitely tiny flashlight is concentrating a focused beam that reflects to a Y value of four. And this is what we mean when we say that the limit as X approaches two of our function F of X is four. Notice that although this is an infinitely tight beam, it's still different from the laser pointer. The laser pointer saw the value of the function at two directly. And so because of that single point discontinuity, it reflected an output of seven. But the flashlight, by virtue of the tiny little dot we stuck in the middle, never sees the value of x equals two directly, no matter how tiny it gets. It just sees a tighter and tighter beam 
around the input of 2 reflecting an output of 4. And this is the core of what a limit is. It's the reflection of an infinitely tiny flashlight with a tiny little dot in the middle. Now that we have a definition, I want to take a look at a few examples. And to start with, I want to acknowledge that this initial example might feel a little contrived. Like, why would we ever define a function like this that behaves like x squared at every single value except for 2? Well, I'll admit that redefining it as 7 is a little bit contrived. But what is common is to run into a function that simply has a hole in it at a certain value. And in fact, functions like this are central to the whole enterprise of calculus. For example, one of the first things that we typically do with limits is calculate a derivative, which is essentially the slope of a function at a single point. But the problem with that definition is that you can normally only calculate slope between two different points. Slope is rise over run, right? What does that even mean if the run is zero? Well, let's say that we're trying to figure out the slope of y equals x cubed at the point x equals 1. As I said, there's no direct way to calculate it. But what we can do is consider the slope between that point on the graph, whose coordinates are 1, 1, and any other point on the graph, whose coordinates would be x, x cubed. The rise would be x cubed minus 1, and the run would be x minus 1. And so the slope, rise over run, would be the rational function x cubed minus 1 divided by x minus 1. And to be clear, this function is not the derivative of the function x cubed as a whole. It's a function focusing on the slope between our point of interest at x equals 1 and all other points on the graph of x cubed. As we move x around, the different slopes we get trace out this rational function. And the derivative, the thing we really care about, would be the value of that function at x equals 1, since that would give us the slope between x equals 1 and itself, which is to say the slope right at x equals 1. But guess what? The slope function has a hole in it right there at x equals 1, the one value that we care about. And of course it does. That's the whole problem. That's where the points converge, leading to a division by 0 and an undefined slope. But when we look at the graph, it sure looks like it's approaching a value at x equals 1. There's just a hole there. So what do we do? We pull out our trusty dotted flashlight, center it right on x equals 1, and make it really, really tiny. And when we do, we can see that the value the slope is approaching is 3. The derivative of x cubed at x equals 1 is 3. It's something that we can only talk about with limits, because you can't directly calculate a slope over a distance of 0. The result would be undefined. By the way, it's worth walking through how you calculate this limit algebraically. Typically what you would do is factor the top, which happens to be a difference of cubes, and then cancel the x minus 1 term. From there, you can just plug in the value directly and see that the limit is 3. But what exactly are you really doing here? Well, when you cancel the x minus 1, what you're really doing is replacing one function with another. And this new function is completely identical to the original function, except that it doesn't have a hole at x equals 1. This swap won't make any difference to the limiting value, because remember, the dot in the middle of our flashlight means that it never sees the value of x equals 1. But what filling in the hole does do is allow us to just pull out our laser pointer and calculate the limit by directly plugging in the value. Solving limits often involves this kind of sleight of hand, swapping out functions that are the same except at the limiting point. In fact, since the flashlights get infinitely tiny, you can actually swap out the function even if it's wildly different outside of the local neighborhood of the limiting point. All that matters is that you don't mess with the function within the beam of that infinitely tiny flashlight. I think it's time that we take a look at some fun examples. To start with, I want to emphasize a little bit this idea of a local neighborhood by comparing this function, which has a point discontinuity at x equals negative 2, with this function, which on the surface looks exactly the same, right? But when we zoom way, way in on this second function, we can see that there's actually a really, really tiny plateau around negative 2. If we take our tiny dotted flashlight to the first function, no matter how small the flashlight gets, it still has a blind spot exactly at negative 2, and we can see that the limiting value is 1. But for the second function, as we shrink our flashlight, eventually it gets small enough to be lighting up that tiny plateau, which means that the limiting value is actually 4, the height of the plateau. Limits are truly a local phenomenon. How local? Infinitely local. Okay, but what about this function, which has a jump discontinuity? If we train our flashlight directly on the point of discontinuity, no matter how tiny we make it, it still highlights two different spots on the y-axis. So because there's no one limiting value, we would say that this limit does not exist. But that's a little unsatisfying because it really feels like there's two limits. 
So what we can do in this case is use a special one-sided flashlight, which you might know as the right or left-sided limit. If you train the right-sided flashlight on the point of discontinuity, you can see that we reach a limiting value of negative one. Whereas if you use a left-sided flashlight, we instead reach a limiting value of two. So we can say that the limit as x approaches three from the right of f of x is negative one, and the limit from the left is two. We still say that the limit as a whole doesn't exist, but it's nice to be able to capture the fact that there is a well-defined limiting behavior from one side or the other. Notice, by the way, that neither of these values would be affected by having the function defined in some strange way at the point of discontinuity, because our one-sided flashlights still have a blind spot directly in the center of their vision. Okay, now check out this classic example, sine of one over x. Or actually, let's do sine of one over x minus two plus two, translating it up and to the right for ease of visualization. As we approach x equals two, one over x minus two blows up to infinity, which causes the sine wave to wiggle faster and faster and faster and faster. So what if we try to take the limit as x approaches two? Well, as you can see, no matter how tiny we make our flashlight, the wiggles just keep coming. And you can see that the reflection of the beam onto the y-axis always covers the whole interval of values taken by the sine wave. Since it never hones in on a particular value, the limit does not exist. But check it out, just because we have infinite oscillation doesn't mean we can't have a limit. The function x times sine of one over x, by virtue of multiplying x, causes the amplitude of the infinitely fast sine wave to shrink towards zero. Again, for the visualization, I'm gonna shift this function up and to the right. And you can see that as I tighten the flashlight beam, the reflection on the y-axis also tightens, leading to a clear limiting value. By the way, you can even get the same effect with functions that are completely discontinuous, like this one, which is equal to x when x is irrational and zero when x is rational. Because the beam tightens as we approach zero, the limit actually exists. Oh, hey, one last example, because it looks really, really silly with the flashlights. Maybe you've run into the concept of a limit at infinity. Well, for that, you just have to imagine an infinitely wide flashlight beam going off to infinity. And as that beam moves to the right, if the reflection on the y-axis converges to a point, you've got yourself a limit. Now, so far, I've defined a limit as the reflection of an infinitely tiny flashlight with a little dot in the middle. But for whatever reason, most math textbooks find this definition a little unrigorous. Instead, you might have seen this definition called the epsilon delta definition of a limit. And if you're like me, the first time you saw this, you found it a little bit intimidating. But it's really not so bad if you think about it with flashlights and targets. So remember how with this function we showed that as we choose smaller and smaller flashlights around the x value of two, the resulting beam reflected on the y-axis tends towards four? Well, what does that mean that it tends towards four? Well, the rigorous way of defining it is to say that no matter how small of a target we place around y equals four, we can make our flashlight small enough to narrow the beam onto that target. Like, say I shrink the target down to a radius of one. Well, if I shrink the flashlight down to a radius of 0.2, its beam hits the target. But what if I make the target really, really tiny, like a radius of 0.1? Well, again, if I make the flashlight even tinier, like say a radius of 0.01, the resulting beam hits the target. So the rigorous definition of a limit is that for any size of target on the y-axis, we can find a size of dotted flashlight small enough so that if x starts within the beam of the flashlight, y ends up inside of the target. You might call this the target flashlight definition of the limit. But since Greek letters give it that formal math vibe, it's traditional to call the radius of the target epsilon and the radius of the flashlight delta. The condition that we start within the beam of the flashlight then looks like this, and the condition that we end up within the target looks like this. I'll put a little extra explanation up on the screen in case you want to pause and think about it for a second. So the final rigorous definition that we come to is that for any epsilon greater than zero, that's the size of our target, we can find a delta greater than zero, that's the width of our flashlight beam, so that if zero is less than absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, meaning x starts inside of our flashlight beam, then the absolute value of y minus l is less than epsilon, meaning that y ends up on our target. So that's limits. They're just really, 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 really teeny tiny flashlights with really teeny tiny blind spots in the middle. Nothing to freak out about, unless you're freaking out about how cool they are. Oh, and by the way, if you're new to this channel, I don't really know what the heck it's supposed to be. It's somewhere in between a music channel and a math channel and a coding channel. 
If you're a math person, you might get a kick out of some of my other Summer of Math Exposition videos, which have more of a musical bent to them. But in the spirit of this year's competition, I just wanted to try explaining a standard topic in a creative way. And I'd love to hear in the comments how that went, if it gave you any new insights about how limits work. Oh, and don't forget, I put a link to the Desmos graph up on my Patreon as a public post. You don't have to sign up for Patreon or anything to try it. But of course, while you're there, you might want to check out this post where you can download your very own fractal drum machine. Or this post where you can download a program that lets you explore the consonants and dissonance of different intervals under different timbres. And hey, if you do become a patron, know that first and foremost, you're helping support more videos like this. Thanks so much for watching.